people need to believe some things. And if there's a charismatic enough person, if there are people in need for that charismatic person to offer mercy, they will believe it. You haven't actually addressed the key question that I keep proposing to you and to everyone else, which is what convinced the first apostles that Christ had risen from the dead. The people who opposed Christ were almost never the poor people, unless they were bribed by the richer people. Can I, can I, can I, can I come back on that? Is Satan part of God? No. Then God is not omnipresent? No, this is a, a logical fallacy. Yes, completely it is. Because God is omnipresent and everything is part of God. Are you, do you want to give a monologue or hear a reply? Okay. So in terms, when, 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 when you look at any of the classical philosophers, when they talk about omnipresence, what they're not talking about is the idea that, that, that everything is a part of God. What you're confusing is pantheism with omnipresence. These are two different terms and they have two different meanings. The presence of God means that, that God is present everywhere that, that is not part of it. In the sense of God's presence is here now between us. He's within you and he is within me, but you are not part of God. There isn't some pantheistic uh, union of all being. The ontology of God is different from your ontology. And, and sort of playing around with these kinds of words and stretching their meaning to the point of ridiculousness only demonstrates that it's a, a kind of mentality that's not based upon learning. Do you understand that there's a difference between pantheism and omnipresence? Yes. But look, what you're What's saying... pantheism? No, listen, listen. Let me ask you something. What you're saying is, God is part of me, but I'm not part of God. I'm saying that the, the, the nature of your being is not the divine nature. The, de the ontology of God, the being of God, is something unique and separate to his entire creation. And he's not part of me. Correct. Then he's not within us. But he is present here. He is present here. If he's not part of me, uh, he's not inside me. Well, you were let's saying put it this way. So let, let me ask you this question. Am I present here with you? In terms of what? Am I present here with you? Yes. There you go. But am I part of you? No. Okay. The bacteria, the bacteria that, and the viruses and the germs that are inside your body and my body right now, are they part of us? They're part of me. So you're saying that your germs are part of you? Yeah, the cells compose me. No, no, no. A germ is a separate cell. Okay, but they're still inside me. If you're infected with a bacteria, is that bacteria a part of you or just in you? Are the infected cells part of me? A bacteria is its own cell. Okay. Are the infected cells by a virus part of me? Well, on that one, yes, you have a point. But in terms of the bacteria, if we're going to use an accurate analogy, you accept that you can be infected with bacteria. Yes. Would you, act, you, you? I'm sure you know that bacteria is its own organism. It's its own cell. Right. So if your body can be infected by bacteria, is that part of you without being you? I think it's part of me because when I get cured from the bacteria, it stops being part of me. You know that we have bacteria inside us. For example, in the stomach, they help us digest the food. Yes. They they are not quite us but they are inside us. Yes, but inside you isn't the same as being you, is it? Yeah, but they help us digest food. They are beneficial for us and they are inside us. They help Just, us. Live. I mean, that's a symbiotic relationship and every doctor will tell you that. But, but even a symbiotic relationship, whether we use good bacteria or bad bacteria, my analogy still stands. Sure. We have something that is in you but not part of you. The bacteria in, that lines your gut, the good bacteria, is not part of you. Your body just tolerates its existence because it has learned that it's useful. The bacteria that tries to kill you is not part of you. It is bacteria that's invading your body, which is why your white cells fight it and seek to expunge it from the body. But they are not part of you, they are in you. So it is possible for something to be in you, but not part of you. And whilst it is a crass analogy, it is so it is with God's spirit. God's spirit is in you, but he is not part of it. So he's like a bacteria inside you. I said it was a crass analogy. 
Okay, fine. But uh, so now that we've is he, is he a physical entity. So now that now that we've established that God's spirit can be in you, but not necessarily part of you, God can be present without being the same. What is the spirit? What exactly is the spirit? A fair question. The, are we talking about generally in terms of spirit? Or are you talking about the Holy Spirit as in God's Holy Spirit? What's the difference between the two? There's a massive difference. What is it? Well, all spirits, you have a spirit, I have a spirit, all created things, all created humans have a spirit. That spirit is created. Okay, what it is, is my spirit? Is it, is, it, it is, no, no, that's just your mind. Your, your spirit is another substance that is not at the fore of your existence. It, it lay within your flesh, it lay within your blood. And so it is not tangible because it exists within your flesh and your blood. But that, but God's spirit, by contrast, because you asked what was the difference, God's spirit is an uncreated spirit. It is a spirit that had no beginning and will have no end, and is not limited in the same way that your spirit is limited. So it doesn't exist. Logically, that doesn't follow at all. It, uh, it has no limits. It has no uh, lines that define it. Yeah. That means that logically it doesn't exist. No, that's 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 absolute rubbish. Okay. Imagine that's a drawing. No, okay, a drawing on a on white sheet, yeah. and you have a drawing with a black no, pen. Now erase all the lines that define the drawing. What do you get? You get nothing. You get perfection, which is the nothingness of unexistence. You need those lines. You need something to define. Some limits to exist. If you have absolutely no limits at all. You don't exist. It's as simple as that. That is why perfection and uh, absol uh, the absolution is unexistence. Y your, your, analogy, simply, uh, your, analogy, uh, your analogy is totally flawed. Is it? Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, limit the creator by the terms of, of creation. But incidentally, what you're left with is a blank sheet of paper. Now, the, the, the fact, so you can't get to the uncreated from the created. But then that's where your logic falls down. God himself is the first principle. He is the first principle of all being. And as such, he is not defined by the way that he defines us. Okay. It is by his definition that we are defined. So therefore, we cannot look back to the one who defines our limits and try to define to him his limits. Yes. Because he is the one that defined limits for us. Yes. So therefore, there is this radical separation between the divine and the created that we cannot cross, only he can cross. Fair enough. And he only crosses it if he chooses to do so, which incidentally he did around Christmas. Okay, okay. You so know? let me get this straight. Us and God is basically like comparing a bidimensional and a three-dimensional being. They can't, uh, you know, interact with each other. The bidimensional being will never understand the three-dimensional being. So us and God is like a being with more dimensions than us. Uh, and us trying to understand it. We won't be able to understand it because we are, uh, he transcends us. Is that what you're saying? Okay, so in terms of what that, what, in terms of what your analogy seems to communicate to you, which is the idea that God cannot be comprehended by us, yes. then yes, I'm willing to go with that. However, I'm not willing to take that analogy anywhere else. All, but you, you, you've put in other words, you put in other words, that, that God is beyond our comprehension. Yes. And let's just deal with that point. Okay. God is completely beyond our comprehension. Agreed. Now, if, agreed. if God is beyond our comprehension, does it make any sense to try and place any rational limits on God? Of course not. It, would you agree with me that's irrational? Yes, but my question now is, how can you be certain that your belief in God is the real God, is the belief in the true God, if we have absolutely no uh, comprehension of God, if we are completely transcending to God? If you completely transcend us and we don't have any any kind of understanding of him, how can we have any idea whatsoever what God is and what you know that uh, your Christian, right? How can you say that your idea of uh, God is the real? Okay, an absolutely fair question. Um, okay, so in terms of in terms of us knowing who God is, as Christians, we believe that the the, the most perfect representation of God to man is in Jesus Christ because for us as human beings to understand someone well to understand someone perfectly to get the best image we need God to become a man 
because anything less than that will be deficient. Deficient in language, like the Quran, which only exists in Arabic. Deficient in imagery, like the Gospels themselves, which only capture an image of, of the Christ. God becoming man is what represents the fact of, of God's disposition, his mind and his character. In terms of what confirms this as the truth, is the resurrection. That Christ, that man, who is the very image of the Father, died on a cross and rose from the dead. And in so far as conquering death is the supreme conquest that all human souls desire, that all human uh, spirits wish for, ultimately, to escape death. To see that triumph in Christ, the conqueror, means that all that he is and all that he has said and all that he did is confirmed in a real historical event. That real historical event is the foundation of my religion. That real historical event is where my, my faith begins. Because unlike, say, the mythologies of Nordic mythology of Scandinavia or, or the, the old Saxon pagan mythologies or the Hindu mythologies, yeah, that are clearly mythologies, the Christian faith is rooted in an historical episode. The first disciples of the Christ, with every disposition not to believe that a man could rise from the dead, believed that their teacher, who they had seen crucified, they had seen again, post-mortem, alive. And the challenge that is faced by every non-believer is to give a, a historical account that accounts for all the evidence that explains away the resurrection. And I am yet to meet any valid argument that can do that. Okay, so your whole faith in God resides in the simple fact that Christ was resurrected. All of it comes down to this one act, this one miracle. No, I, I, have, I have personal subjective evidences that are convincing to me, but I wouldn't offer them to you because they're, they're subjective to myself. I've had mystical encounters with the divine. I've had um, prophetic words from the divine. I have communed with the divine. I had prayers answered. But none of these things are going to convince you, and so I don't offer them to you. What I do offer to you is something that you yourself can go and investigate, that you yourself can go and weigh up and measure with your own mind. Something objective, something that is historical, and because it's historical, it's open to historical inquiry. And I simply invite you to do so and to follow the evidence wherever it leads. Because if you dismiss all other conclusions, this is quoting Spock, by the way, whatever remains, no matter how preposterous has to be the answer. And the fact is that when you look at all the hypotheses that explain that, that historical encounter of the risen Jesus, the only one that actually makes sense is the fact that Christ did rise from the dead. And if Christ did rise from the dead, then all the, all the gloating and the, the pontificating that Muslims make about the Quran is nonsense, it's noise because it's just a book, a book that most of us can't read anyway. All the, to bring the, all the, all the mythologies, them. all the mythologies that, um, you know, the Nordics of past or old could offer or, or Hindus can offer, passes into nothing. All of the great arguments of the Richard Dawkins of this world, they all collapse because if Christ did rise from the dead, that throws your whole world upside down. Would you agree with me? That if it did happen, if he did, and if other things that uh, are recorded in the, I mean, not in the Bible, but about uh, the mythology about Christ, I would call it mythology, because we have historical accounts about Christ. We do. We do. I had a big discussion with a bunch of guys saying that Christ didn't exist, and uh, prove me, prove me that he exists. I told them, there's a historian called Tacitus, uh, or Tacitus, whichever yeah. pronunciation you prefer, who is a... You know, he's a respectable Roman historian. He recorded about Christ, that there was a guy called Christ. There was, you know, he had some followers who were the apostles. And they expanded his faith, expanded his ideology and his way of living to the other people and created Christianity. Right? Just so you know, Josephus was a, a turncoat Jew who fell in line with the Romans. 
Um, he was actually a captured militant. Who? Josephus. And, and, another and he remained a Jew. No, it's the same Josephus you're talking about. Tacitus. I'm sure it's Josephus, but I'm happy to be corrected. Maybe I'm wrong. Someone can Google it. I'm going to stick it on the YouTube. I think it's Josephus. But uh, you either might read way, Tacitus either way. again. But, uh... Either way, Tacitus, Josephus. The fact of the matter is, as you're obviously aware, is that the Christian faith has many of its core doctrines supported by other historians who are themselves not Christian. Yeah, but the thing is, that's, that's, that's where the difficult part comes. Because uh, there are historical records of Christ. Everybody, I mean, everybody with some uh, historical knowledge agrees that there was a man called Christ. Yes. He existed, he yes. created yes. what we know now as Christianity. I mean, kind of, he didn't create exactly this kind of Christianity. But he started. He was yeah. the guy who started building. You know. yeah. uh, but now the problem comes. And the problem is, uh, there are no real historical records of him being resurrected. No, there are. There are. I don't believe that. Well, I mean, in terms of, in terms of, that's the big problem. No, we do. We 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 have we have the the testimony of both the apostolic. We have the testimony of the apostolic writings. Basically, that's a historical witness. Okay, but those were no. Hold on one second. Hold, hold on one second. That's not a dismissal. It is it is too complacent and too lazy of you to simply say that that historical evidence, which confronts me with a truth that I would much rather not accept is not historical evidence. That's very lazy thinking. Okay, fair when enough. It, one second. Fair enough. When a historian approaches a historical question, they look at all the historical evidence. Yes. So when, you know, Christ, you know, when historians look at the crimes of Nazi Germany, they don't just look at the testimonies and accounts of all the Jews and all the people that suffered under the Nazis. They look at all the Nazi documents. That's how a historian constructs history. Yes. So when a historian approaches this question, they have to include, as well as Josephus and Tacitus and yes. Sartorius and, and all these other historical uh, documents, they have to include an engagement with the New Testament. Okay. And the New Testament is our earliest witness. The letters of Paul predate the Gospels and the Gospels predate everything else. And their testimony is clear. Christ was crucified, Christ rose again, Christ will come again. Now the come again is not a historical question, so we can't deal with it like history. That is a matter of personal belief. But in terms of history, we have to look at why these, this community, this first community, believed that a man that everyone accepted had died, including Josephus and Tacitus, suddenly they're going around proclaiming that he had risen again. Why? That's the whole point of the Gospel of Mark, was to prove that the Messiah could suffer and rise again. That's what the Gospel of Mark teaches, and that's our first Gospel. And it's repeated again in Matthew, Mark, sorry, Matthew, Luke and John. So what was it that took those first Jewish believers to believe that Christ was the Messiah, that Christ had died on a cross, and that he had risen again? Bearing in mind that they had every predisposition culturally not to accept a suffering messiah and certainly not to accept that an individual could rise again. Yep. So my question, that's my question to you. What could, what could convince that first people? The first people. The first. Not me, because I could just believe because someone else tells me to believe. So I'm not talking about me. I'm not even talking about the second generation of Christians who will believe just because the apostles tell them. I'm asking you, what could convince the apostles that their teacher, who they had seen from seen die, had risen again, post, and that they'd seen him post mortem? Well, I think we can all agree that Jesus was a very charismatic figure yes. in history. He had a power to um, convince people, to show people his way. Yes, he had, uh, you know. I think we can all agree about that. Many people around history have that power, have the power to convince people of their own ideology and people start believing them as if they, that's the absolute truth. Mm -hmm. uh, but look, what convinced the Arabs to start believing Muhammad, to start following Islam? Now, my... Uh, no, 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 I'll, no. I'll let, let let, let, no, sorry, I want you to address my question. What my question is, people? what convinced the first apostles? The apostles themselves. Yes. Because Jesus was a very charismatic man. So your argument is that he was charismatic yes. and that charisma convinced them that a dead man had risen from the dead. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm so saying tell me what you are saying. Char that's his what I charisma heard. convinced them of his ideology. And after they knew his ideology, they decided to expand it 
to give him kind of a requiem after his death, which resulted in the stories about his resurrection. Except that is not what they proclaimed. You're, what, you're, what, hold on, what you're doing? What you're doing is you're ahistorically rewriting their witness to suit your argument. Fair enough. Let you're not. No, 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 no. What, 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 let me give you another, what, another example. What, what, one second. No, no, one second. No, one, no, I want to deal with your argument because what you're doing is you are you are attempting to rewrite the historical witness to suit your own worldview. The historical witness is clear that Christ bodily rose from the dead and that is what convinced the first apostles that he was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God, that he was this divine figure that is talked about in Daniel. That, that is the thing that convinced them, that's the thing that radicalized them. And the historical witness is clear. You have to deal with that thing. I know there was not one apostle who didn't believe one... until he put his fingers inside exactly. his, uh, his wounds. Exactly. That's how the story goes. But now, listen. Let me give you an example. Do you know the Iliad? Yes, I know about the Iliad. Uh, the Iliad depicts the Trojan War. It is a historical fact that Tro the Troy existed, and there was a Trojan War, and the Greeks took Troy, and then you know there was Aeneas who fled to Rome, and uh, then we have Rome. The Iliad has Greek gods in it. It has many depictions of Greek mythology. It's the only, the only historical document of the Trojan War. And yet we know that the Trojan War happened because there's archaeological proof that it happened. There's, uh, you know, leftovers of Troy, there's leftovers of the culture. There are, you know, uh, there are many, many things that prove that it existed. Now, my question to you is, should we believe what was said in the Iliad, word by word, that every single miracle done by the Greek gods actually happened. Because that's the parallelism that I'm trying to do here. You're trying to believe, you're trying to make me believe it. And fair enough, you know, the, 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 uh, the stories of the apostles are historically accurate. And I can't deny it completely. I can't just say, no, they're not. Uh, let me give you another example. Can I just, let, let me okay. just deal with it. I dispute with you the amount of evidence that supports the idea that, that the whole saga of Troy was a real event in history. I actually think that the evidence is, is very weak. Um, and certainly the Iliad has the idea of a Greek mythology in the sense that the, the writers were interpreting historical events and, and also possibly mythological events that had been passed on to them in terms of their own religious paradigm. But what you're not engaging with is the fact that first century Jews had no predisposition to believe that their Messiah was going to be a suffering servant. They expected their Messiah to become an all-conquering king. So the first thing is their disposition is contradicted by what happened. Secondly, some Jews, not all Jews, but some Jews believed in the idea of a general resurrection. The idea that at some point in the future everyone would rise from the dead together. But not all Jews believed that. Many Jews actually denied the idea of the resurrection at all. And no Jews believed the idea that an individual, that an individual would rise from the dead. So again, they had every cultural disposition not to believe. We have other examples where false messiahs have followings and then when those messiahs die, the Jews simply go away, they walk away. They were messiahs before Jesus, there were other messiahs at the time of Jesus and there were other messiahs after Jesus. And when those messiahs died, the Jews just left them. They didn't develop this belief that that messiah would rise again. Finally, when a great teacher, a rabbi, did die, the disposition, the cultural norm of the Jews was to turn their graveyard, their grave into a tomb and to remember their teacher by going and venerating the tomb. Okay? That was their disposition. The first Jews didn't do that with Jesus. They did turn his tomb into a temple, but that came later. What they actually went and did is proclaim that he had risen from the dead. And that's what you've got to deal with. Not try to rewrite the historical account, but deal with the historical account, which is that the first apostles, with every disposition not to, came to believe that their Messiah had suffered, died, and rose again. 
So what could convince them? You're simply saying, oh, well, they mythologized it. It was his charisma, and then they built onto it. But what you're essentially doing is ignoring their own witness. Their own witness was that this Christ had risen from the There's dead. There's a second part. So, the second part is, do you know how Christianity was called by the Romans in the beginning of its conception? Yeah, in, the, in, in Antioch. No, no, how, how the Romans usually called them. They yeah, called they called them Christians. They called it the religion of slaves. Do yes. you know why? Yeah, because most, many converts were slaves. Exactly. Do you know who in ancient Greece who practiced uh, the Greek religion? It was the rich people, it was the citizens. The slaves didn't really care about it too much. I mean, the slaves had to kind of uh, get, uh, get some homage to their, the Greek god so they wouldn't get beaten up. But the slaves weren't the central of their religion. The heroes were. The heroes, the powerful ones. And that's why we have the Iliad, the show, the strong Greeks uh, fighting the Trojans and, you know, uh, conquering new lands and all that stuff. Now, who practiced Christianity? The slaves, the unfortunate, the people who needed something where to belong, some, some way of not being oppressed. That's how Christianity started. It has a very, very different origin to uh, most other religions. And that's why it's very unique. But still, you need to, you, you, uh, I'm certain that you understand it, that Christianity was practiced mostly by the downtrodden, not by the people in power. Obviously, the people in power hated Christian gods. They hated the guts of those guys because, uh, what the hell is this? The slaves are trying to be equal to us. Go, go to the Colosseum, go be fed to the animals. That's how they treated the Christians because they wanted some kind of equality. Now, there, there are many people who say that Christianity, you know, they, they supported slavery. Complete bullshit. Christianity was built on opposing slavery. It was built by the slaves, against slavery. Now, my point is here, there were many, many, many causes for the Christ, for, for the downtrodden to support Christianity. And Christ, again, he was a very, very uh, charismatic figure. Now, what do we have in front of us? We have a whole bunch of downtrodden people, of people who live horrible lives, who need to be to belong somewhere. We have a very charismatic messiah who's very kind, who's very caring, who you know gives a ideology of equality to everyone. And we have his disciples who follow him everywhere, who were they were also usually uh, they were they were you know they were usually not very uh, people that were not very high on the hierarchy. There are some uh, exceptions to the apostles, but usually. Uh, now, what do we have here? We have here a perfectly reasonable situation, that uh, in a perfectly reasonable way of Christianity to expand itself to other people around the Roman Empire. And that's exactly how it did expand. It expanded through the slaves. That's why the Christians were prosecuted a lot by the Romans, by the Sassanids. Eventually, the Romans gave in under Constantine the Great. They converted to Christianity. End of the story for the Romans. But the Christians were some of the most prosecuted people in the world. Now, my point is, there are many reasons for Christians to become Christians, for, uh, you know, for uh, people who live shitty lives to become Christians. And, uh, okay, so I don't let, think let, you're me, let, let me reply to that. Uh, I, what, what you have done is, you've moved the debate onto the next generation, the people who became Christians after the first apostles started preaching that Christ had risen from the dead. Yeah, let me finish, let me finish. You haven't actually addressed the key question that I keep proposing to you and to everyone else, which is what convinced the first apostles that Christ had risen from the dead. And it's not surprising that you equivocate on that question and that you move around the question rather than facing into it head on. Because anyone who faces into it head on usually ends up becoming a Christian. Because when you investigate the evidence, the evidence is overwhelming in terms of supporting the idea that Christ rose from the dead. That's the truth. And you're right to point out that many slaves became Christians. And the reason why many slaves became Christians is because Christianity taught a radical, a truly radical equality between slave and free, between man and woman, and between Gentile and Jew. And that's why everybody fell out with the Christians, because of our radical disposition towards put towards this equality that is afforded to us in Christ our Lord. Now, that being said, you mustn't characterize the early church so quickly and so bluntly, because there were equally there's equally evidence that many Christians came from rich and well-educated backgrounds. 
So we see in the book of Acts and we see in the letters of Paul the fact that people were able to house the Christians in their houses. Those were the first churches. It was a house church. So, so the fact of the matter is that those those Christians who are housing the church had to own houses, and slaves don't own houses. Secondly, the Gospel of Luke was written for an individual, Theophilus. Now, producing a document like the Gospel of Luke in Roman times is a particularly expensive activity. And Theophilus didn't just produce the Gospel of Luke, he also produced the Gospel of Acts. He commissioned them both through Luke. Meaning that there's clearly evidence that as very early on, as still within the lifetime of the Apostles, we have uh, Christians from every strata of society. Bearing in mind, there can't be equality between the slave and the free unless both slave and free are Christian. So, your characterization homes in on some of the truth, but ignores the wider picture. And I still, and this is the last time I'm going to ask you to engage with it, I want you to give me a good reason to believe, other than Christ actually rose from the dead, to convince me what convinced the very first people who proclaimed the idea that Christ had risen from the dead, that he had actually risen from the dead. You're asking me a very funny question. People have believed in the religions all around history. People need to believe in something. People choose to believe in something. That's why the first. That's how the first religions, the shamanic religions, were made. You know, they had religions uh, very different from ours now. For example, the religion of the Aztecs. They thought that they needed to sacrifice uh, the capture of, in war to their sun god, so the sun would keep shining. People need to believe some things. And if there's a charismatic enough person, if there are people in need for that charismatic person to offer mercy, they will believe it, they will take it, because they need that mercy. They need something to, uh, some kind of purpose. Now, let me give you the example, and the example is the Bible. The Bible explains, does it, does it explain about the great uh, achievements of Christ, how we fought lions, how we defeated dragons, how we uh, won wars against tyrants. No, never. The Bible is about simple people. It's about unfortunate people who Christ comes to and he helps them and he, you know, gets them out of their unfortunate uh, life. He gives them hope. He gives the unfortunate hope. Because the Bible is not based on the rich and the powerful and whatever. It's based on the poor, on the, on the ones that are the worst, you know, the, the outcasts of society. That's who the Bible is trying to protect. That's what the Bible is based on. And I don't know why you think that I'm omitting the beginning of Christianity, because it doesn't make that, that much of a big difference. You know, the, who, cruci who made Pontius Pilatus uh, crucify uh, Jesus Christ? the Jewish rabbis made it. Why? Because they were afraid of losing their power. Because Christ was saying he was defending equality and the rabbis wanted to keep their power. They wanted to have the power to uh, continue to be rabbis. Christ was a, was a death penalty for them because they've been all their life, they've been living above the common folk. And now this uh, motherfucker just shows up and says, oh, you know, everybody's equal. You rabbis, you're equal to the poor people. The rabbis lost their mind. They needed to kill this person because they needed to maintain their power. The people who opposed Christ were almost never the poor people unless they were bribed by the richer people. Can I, can I, can I, can I come back on that? Because okay. this, is, this is my third attempt to ask you to engage... What do you well, let me finish. to say about it? I, I, this is my third attempt asking you to engage with the, all the evidence that demonstrates that the first apostles of Christ believed that Christ had risen from the dead. And all you've done is come out with this quasi-Marxist narrative based upon the idea that the poor believe. But that that's, doesn't that's actually deal, again, but, but it, again, as, again, it does not deal with the real evidence. It does not deal with the evidence that actually many rich people followed Christ, such as the fact that Mark followed Christ. Mark was a tax collector. Tax collecting was quite a lucrative role. Christ took sinners and he took sinners wherever he found them, whether they were the prostitutes and the harlots, the drunkards, whether they were Con the lepers who were considered sinners outcasts. or whether they were the tax collectors he took yes. the outcasts but not necessarily the poor a tax collector 
who was an agent of Rome, had more power in occupied Palestine than a rabbi, even if he was hated for it. Now, furthermore, you have an engagement, the question I've proposed to you three times. And I'm not going to ask it again because there's other people I want to go and talk to. But I will leave you with this question and I will ask you to engage with the evidence. Because you, you, you talked about the Bible, you know, just out of interest, do you have a Bible? Yeah. Right, okay. So I read it when I was a child. Yeah, most people do and then they keep their child, childhood perspectives into adulthood rather than saying, when I was a child, I thought like a child, but now I am a man, I need to reflect upon what I thought as a child and see if it's still valid. So I'm going to give you some scriptures, I'm going to invite you to read them, and I'm going to invite you to come back with your questions if you have them. Because the evidence shows that the first community taught, not that Christ was just a charismatic figure who went to his death, but he was a charismatic figure who was the Messiah in the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, that he was crucified, and I think up to this point you're with me, but this is where we probably part company, that he rose from the dead. And if he rose from the dead, you have to have a good reason to explain that belief away. And simply saying, well, people need to believe in something, isn't a good reason. Because they could have believed that Christ was a great rabbi who taught radical equality without having to believe that he had risen from the dead. They could have believed that Christ was a great teacher, a great moral teacher, just a man, without believing that he had risen from the dead. They had every predisposition to do so. They celebrate many rabbis from the time of Christ who they don't declare as either a messiah having crucified or risen from the dead. But they make specific claims about Jesus. And you have to engage with the evidence and those claims. And if like me, after investigating it, you discover that all the evidence points to Christ really rose from the dead, then this flips your worldview upside down. And it means that there has to be a radical change in you. There have been other people who have been recorded as dead and then they rose from the dead. Do you know that they are, you know, they stick nails, uh, not nails, uh, needles underneath the nails of dead people to make sure that they are dead. Because the brain functions don't die when the heart stops, stops beating. And sometimes it has been recorded in, in history and in medical science that people have risen from the dead because they, their brain was not dead yet. And in the grave, they tried to claw their way out of the coffin and they died of suffocation. It has been proven many times. So I'm not completely contesting the, that you know it's impossible that Jesus could have risen from the dead. But look, I'll just tell you one thing. It's terribly convenient that every single historical source says everything about Christ except that he rose from the dead and only his uh, uh, apostles, only his followers, people who were who would die for him, who would do anything for him, only they say that he rose from the dead. And you have to engage with that. The fact that those first apostles were so convinced that he had risen from the dead that they were willing to die for him. The question that you have to do in some introspection about is to ask yourself what could convince them that they would die for it. And furthermore, I just want to, your mischaracterization of historical sources. The New Testament is a historical source. When historians look about what happened to the life of Jesus, the place that they go is the New Testament. And they go to other documents around that time period. They don't go to the Quran. They don't go to the Bhagavad Gita. They don't go to any other sources. They go to the New Testament. Well, how is the Quran so, supposed to say what, the life of Jesus if it's Well, exactly. Before, it's not a historical it, source. It, I mean, uh, it, it, after yeah, Jesus. Exactly. After, it, it's after, not a historical after. source. And so it can give no historical commentary upon the real life of Jesus. But these were written at the time of Christ's life. They were written within decades of his ascension. The New Testament was, yes. I mean, most of the text of the Bible was actually written before Christ. Yes, I'm t I, I did specifically say the New Testament. I did specifically say that. But what's really interesting is if you read the Old Testament, it prophesies the Messiah. And it gives over 300 prophecies about the Messiah that for them to be fulfilled couldn't just be that Christ himself was acting in such a way as to make them happen, but other people surrounding Christ conspired to make those things happen. 
and statistically that's impossible which means that you have there a miraculous evidence to the truth of Christian faith beyond simply the resurrection now I, I want to speak to some of the people it's been a pleasure speaking with you you do better at talking than you do at heckling so Merry Christmas Merry Christmas yeah I mean and it's I already over but so uh, no 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 you're wrong okay yeah. oh yeah well, I, uh, you're the Christmas one who said that it lasts is still while. going on yeah, yeah, yeah. you don't know your own culture bro okay, okay, you don't okay. know your own heritage in, uh, in the Eastern where are you from in East, the Eastern Christians they celebrate Christmas in a different day yes Julian oh, you're going uh, when the, Julian calendar when the, yeah when yeah, the, yeah. When yeah. the yeah. so for you yeah yeah Christ. Well, no, 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 no. They celebrate Christmas by the Julian calendar, which puts it about the 7th of January. Yeah, but uh, yeah. it's the day when the Magi kings came to Christ. Yeah, yeah but no, 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 no. In, in Portugal, they celebrate no, you, no, it as no, the day no, of you, kings. You got, it, you got it wrong again. No, the, the Christmas is celebrated as the birth, the celebration of the birth of Christ, of which the Magi came. However, in the Julian calendar, it's seven, celebrated on the 7th of January. Go and look it up. Julian calendar, they sell it. use the same calendar. Uh, uh, we, I don't know where you're from, so I don't know that. I'm from Ukraine, but they, we use the same calendar. You're using it's the Gregorian the, calendar? Yes. Right, so Christmas the, is the 25th of December. No. No, you're wrong. You're, it's you're, a different day. You're, con different you're confusing day. the day that presents are given. The presents being given is on a different day because different cultures come up with different points. No, I'm sorry, but you're utterly wrong. If you're following the Gregorian calendar, the first day of Christmas is the 25th of December, and it doesn't matter whether you're in Ukraine or England, because it's the same calendar. I'm telling you, bro, you're wrong. <laughs> you just, just don't know. Day. It's just a different day. No, it's the when same. I lived in Portugal, Christmas is the we same We celebrated day. the, uh, you know, the Portuguese Christmas, which is the Latin Christmas, and we also celebrated the Ukrainian Christmas, which is in, which was in another day. The, the day that presents is given is not Christmas Day. The day that for you it might not. It, for no, <laughs> Christmas Day starts on the 25th of December by the Gregorian calendar, bro. Just go and look it up, honestly. Okay. But this is a side argument. It, it, it's it doesn't matter to the overall conversation. No, no, it doesn't. But I want to give you this. Merry Christmas. Oh, it's thanks. a very nice New Reboot. Testament and Psalms. Yeah, it's to you. Oh, and Psalms, where? Yeah, Psalms. Psalms are at the front. Oh, Psalms. Yeah. So, so have a read of, of it. Yeah. And then write down your questions. And if you see me again, come and ask me them. And people are just showering me with religious books. I get, uh, I got a Quran from another guy a while yeah. ago. Yeah. Unfortunately, the difference is that you can read my book. The book that was given to you yeah, as a Quran isn't in Arabic, so you can't Oops. read it. But anyway, you can read which that. Which book are you talking to? You recommend to start. Right? Well, he's, he's going. Uh, he's gone now. He's gone now. But I, I would suggest that he starts since since our conversation hanged on the idea of the crucifixion, that he starts in the Gospel of Mark. Because the Gospel of Mark clearly testifies that the expected Messiah suffered on a cross and then rose from the dead.